Good morning. I want to say thank you to Schools Out Washington and NSLA for inviting me to share some ideas with you. Um, you know, whenever I hear uh, my bio, um, it's always about what I do at the university. But at heart, I'm a youth worker. Um, I created an organization in Oakland, California to support young people with, with uh, leadership development in re really difficult situations, uh, challenging environments and challenging neighborhoods and challenging schools. And my work, my writing, um, my speaking is all about sharing those lessons so that we can all have greater opportunities and expanded learning opportunities for, for young people who really need it most. Um, I want to share um, a story with you um, about the, the reasons that I wrote the, my new book called Hope and Healing in Urban Education. Um, I'm often asked to speak at youth programs or some, most, most of, of the time college campuses, but I received an interesting invitation about four years ago to come speak at a prison that was not far from my home in Oakland, California, and I debated whether or not I'd take the invitation. And so I decided to take the invitation. The, the email read something like this. There are, there are 10 men here at, in the prison that are reading your, your book, uh, Black Youth Rising, and they'd love for you to come and meet them and share your ideas with them. So I decided to go. So I went out to the prison, and I don't know if you've in, ever visited a prison before, but uh, the first instruction that I got was to show my ID at the gate. So the correctional officer said, um, hey, uh, here is, show, me, show us your ID and you're going to get a number of instructions. Just follow the instructions because the men are waiting in the cafeteria for you. So I showed them the, the ID and the door buzzed open, bzzz, and I walked in and the door shut behind me, boom. She, and the correctional officer, she said, I need you to follow the yellow line all the way to the end of the corridor. So I followed the line to the end of the corridor and there's another door there, and that door buzzed open. Bzzz. And there's a correctional officer waiting for me. The sh door shut behind me. Boom. The correctional officer at that door said, hey, I need you to follow the blue line to the end of the corridor. So I followed the blue line to the end of the corridor. Got to the end of that corridor, and the door buzzed open. Bzzz, and I walked through it. Boom. And it shut behind me. But this time, I, when, the, when the door shut behind me, I began to feel this, this sense of incarceration. I began to feel closed in. I began to feel what it must be like for those men in prison who I was about to see to not have the sun on their face, to not smell the rain, to not be able to hug their children, right? And I began to be really, really insecure. What the heck could I tell them, right, as a college professor? What am I going to share with them that has any impact on their lives? And so I began to feel insecure, and I um, walked into the cafeteria, and the correctional officer, as they opened the door, they said, the men are excited that you're here. Now, I had expected 10 men to be waiting for me, but as I opened the door, as they opened the door, I was surprised and shocked to see 200 men waiting for me in their orange jumpsuits. And they ran up to me, hey, Dr. G, we're glad you're here, man. We're really glad you're here. I'm like, man, I'm glad to be here. I'm really glad to be here. Um, he said, man, my, no, my name is Tony. I've been here since 1987. And I felt just like you did when you heard that. Another young man, or another man came up to me. He said, hey, man, my name is Chris. I said, hey, Chris, how you doing, man? He said, um, we're really glad you're here. We, we, we love your book, man. Look, man, I've been here since 1989. And one by one, they began to, sh to tell me about how glad they were to see me, but also the year that they were brought into incarceration. And again, I began to eat, feel incredibly insecure, and so I took the talk that I was about to share with them and ripped it up and threw it away. I didn't know what I was going to say to them. And they pushed me up to the podium, and I got up there without a speech, and I just began to share with them what was on my heart. I talked to them about the challenges I was having raising a six, foot, a six foot four son in Oakland, California, and my concerns about his safety. I began to share my concerns about my parents, my aging parents, and I just began to talk from the heart. But one of the things I said to them is I said, you're not what you did, right? And that whatever happened, there's still, a, there's still hope for you, right? There's a, still a possibility. 
And I said some more words and shared some ideas with them. And then the correctional officer said, it's time for you to leave. And so I got off the stage, shook some more hands, and they ushered me out of the cafeteria. And just as I was getting ready to leave the cafeteria, I heard a booming voice behind me. Hey, Dr. G. Like, Who's that? And I turned around, and it was his brother. He must have been seven feet tall, 350 pounds. I'm not, this is a true story. And I turned around, I was like, hey, brother. How you doing? And I'm a tall guy. He said, Dr. G, I want to let you know, man, um, check this out. Uh, those words you shared with me, bruh, um, they got me, man. They, they, they touched me, man. I really want to appreciate your humanity showing up for us today. I'm like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you, you got those words. He said, no, man, I want you to really know that those words you shared with me touched me. I'm like, I'm glad they did, man. He said, you see my face? And he kind of bent down. He had a scar that went across his face. He said, people in here think I'm really tough, but I'm not, man. Just because I'm tall and I'm big, and I got in a fight a few years ago and they cut me, man. And it's hard to keep a sense of hope in here, and it's, it's hard for us to stay sane in here, man. It's, it's really tough, and so we have to do things to keep a sense of hope. I said, really, man, I'm sorry to hear that, man. I'm really sorry to hear that. He said, but there's something that I do that keeps my hope up in here, right? And I said, well, what do you do, man? And he reached into his pocket. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> well, are you reaching into your pocket? And he reached into his pocket, and he pulled out a little bottle. And he opened the bottle up, and he blew bubbles. And the bubbles floated over my head. And my first thought was, did this big brother just blow bubbles in my face? <laughs> Why is he blowing bubbles? And he said, as the bubbles were floating over my head in the prison, he said that this reminds me of when I was a child. Right? It, it gives me a sense of hope. And when I blow bubbles, it gives me a sense of peace in here, man. And so they allow me to blow bubbles, and this is what I do every day. I carry this bottle because it gives me a sense of peace and hope and possibility. And so as I was driving home that day, um, thinking about what had just occurred, I began to be deeply curious about everybody's bubble stories. What are the ways in which we create a space of hope in really difficult situations? How do we create opportunities for young people who live in situations that are really treacherous? What are your bubble stories? And I believe that our young people in America, that our job as youth development professionals and as educators and after-school providers are to create bubble stories for young people. That is, that we create a space for them to reimagine their lives. We create a space for them to engage in healing. We create a space for them to engage in profound spaces of hope. And what's more important is that it's not just for young people, but that we ourselves are deeply committed to healing and hope for our own lives. So as I began to think about how is this happening around the country, um, I wrote a book called Hope and Healing in Urban Education. And in the book, I document stories, bubble stories around the country stories in really difficult neighborhoods and schools. Rich, and for example, I'll I'm gonna share a story, a case study with you in Richmond, California, where the director of the program decided to use love to get young men to put their guns down. Or in the south side of Chicago, where they saturated a neighborhood with healing opportunities for young people to heal from their exposure to trauma. And so this notion of hope and healing, I believe, is the most central strategy and important factor in supporting young people's development in America today. But there are challenges to hope, right? Um, I was sharing these ideas with my son, who is now at UCLA. I was like, yeah, there's, I'm trying to write a book about hope. But he shared with me, Dad, you got to listen to this album. You guys know who Kendrick Lamar is, right? So I listened to Kendrick Lamar's album, right? And not his most recent album, because his most recent album is very good too, but this is his earlier album. And he said, I'm a good kid in a mad city, right? 
I'm a good kid that has to navigate my way between the Crips and the Bloods. I'm a good kid who has to navigate poor schools and poor teachers. I'm a good kid who has to decide which block to take to avoid the police. I'm a good kid in a mad city. And I think that our places, our after-school programs, our extended learning opportunities are trying to extend spaces for those good kids in sometimes mad cities. But the research suggests the same thing. James Gabarino calls it social toxicity, right? That is oftentimes the environments in which young people are, are, are forced to develop are embedded in socially toxic environments. Gabarino says, just like there are physical toxins in a, in, a, in a building, imagine your own home or apartment building or where you work, if there, were lead, if there was lead paint or asbestos, right? That eventually that lead paint and asbestos will make you sick, right? And if you're not healed from your exposure to that physical toxin, it can become lethal. Gabarino says in the book called Raising Children in a Socially Toxic Environment that social toxins are sometimes actually more lethal than physical toxins because you can't see them. You can't smell them. Social toxins are things like fear, insecurity, shame, disappointment, stress, anxiety. All of these things are embedded in neighborhoods, in schools, and communities, and sometimes we're not aware of it. This is not in my notes, but I'm going to share this anyway. There's a study done by Denise Brooks Gunn. She was trying to understand the levels of social toxicity among children. And she wanted to know, what is it in the environment that makes some children have greater stress than others? And she simply asked kids, how often do you hear a siren in your neighborhood? And she asked kids in the urban neighborhood and asked kids in the uh, suburban neighborhood, she found a great difference between just hearing sirens right, raise levels of stress and toxicity. Right? So oftentimes, we are working in environments that are socially toxic. And if we're not aware of the forces that are creating that toxicity, sometimes we can reproduce it. James Farmer, or Paul Farmer, calls it structural violence. And the reason that he, he, he uses the term structural violence is that oftentimes when we use the term inequality, we focus on the blocked opportunities. But Farmer says it's not just blocked opportunities because inequality harms people. Inequality also creates depression. Inequality also creates stress. And inequality also creates hopelessness. These are all fundamental ingredients that make it much more difficult for us to support young people. So here's an example. You may be familiar with this example at Spring Valley High School in South Carolina. Um, this is kind of rolling around the internet last year. Girls on her phone. Um, print, there was, the teacher says, put your phone away. The student is defiant. Calls in the principal. Teacher, the, the student ref refuses to put her phone away. The principal calls in the school security, which is a police officer. And what ensues is the police officer pulls the girl out of her desk, flips her over, and then pulls her out of the classroom in front of all of the students. Right? The most insidious part of this act, what happened, is actually not what the police officer did. When I saw this and I heard about it on the news, what was what was most insidious about it is what, how the news covered it. I remember one newscaster saying, well, what did she do to deserve that? And I was immediately shaken by that, because I was thinking if that was my daughter, there's no way, right? There's nothing that can justify that action to that child. We need to be thinking about how each child that we work with and engage with are our children. And there is no excuse for these kinds of actions in our schools. So I'm going to show you, I'm going to take you to my neighborhood in Oakland, California, right? And sort of lay out some examples of the socially toxic environment that young people in Oakland, California, and in um, many chocolate cities around the country are forced to deal with, right? And this is, um, this is a map of Oakland. 
oh, this is a really bright, right? This is a map of Oakland. Oakland is broken down by the flatlands, and then this area here, where it's a little bit lighter, are, are the hills. Oakland is also broken down geographically or um, social economically. In the flatlands here is where more working class people live, and in the hills are more fluent and middle class, right? So the following map is actually a map of the homicides in Oakland. So we can see every year the Oakland Tribune produces a map of these homicides. So we see in 2002, there are 113. In 2003, there are 114. 2005, there are 88. And if you can still notice that where these are occurring, it's not all over Oakland. 2008, it was 94. 146, 2006, and this is a sort of five-year total, right? So if you look at this environment, all these dots, right? This is just one example. Right? The question is, is how are we supporting extended learning opportunities? How are we preparing teachers for young people to have conversations about this? Their exposure to homicides, their exposure to these forms of social toxicity, right? When we talk about these kinds of social toxicities, uh, social toxicity, they create hopelessness. And the research suggests that hopelessness is a predictor of violent behavior. Hopelessness is a predictor of fatalism. Hopelessness is a predictor of depression. It's a predictor of a number of behavioral issues. So the extent to which we address hopelessness, the root cause will have an impact on other kinds of symptoms that we see among young people. But the challenge is, is that how do we, you know, how do we support teachers and community workers to respond with these issues? And I call them existential questions, right? These are questions not about the youth development strategy, these are, not, these are not just questions about the kind of programs that we provide for young people, but these are questions about your life, about your well-being. One of the things that we do in our trainings with young people, when, we, when people ask us to come and train and provide support for after-school programs, one of the things we say is we don't give you just a tool to then go work with young people. We want to know what's going on in your life because we believe that well people are better creating, uh, they're better when they're uh, supporting young people. If you're not well, how do we expect young people to be well, right? And so we begin with existential questions about your life. Are you happy? Are you stressed? Where is your life going? Why are you here? What is your legacy? These are existential questions that you don't need to have an answer for, but you should be wrestling with it, right? Because our belief is that when we are strong and vibrant and flourishing for young people, then we also create the kind of environments where they can flourish as well. So what is hope then? And then how do we build hope in our programs and our, pro our youth development and extended learning opportunities? The research says that hope is a function of three things. The first is future goal orientation, right? where young people can see their lives beyond the present condition, can see their lives beyond the harassment by the police, or see their lives beyond the fact that they may have to find a place to live. They have to see their lives beyond the present condition, right? How are they goals, not, not just goal setting. One of the things we talk about is a courageous imagination, right? It's not just I want a goal to finish high school. It's not just a goal that I want to go to college. It's that I want a life for myself, to see far beyond the present condition, right? We use the term imagination because it is the imagination that allows us to navigate and create a, a sense of justice for young people. What we say is we want young people and adults to fall in love with justice. And you fall in love with justice by engaging yourself in a courageous imagination, not about what, what is, but about what can be. The second is pathways, right? How are we creating a pathways for young people in urban environments and suburban environments and rural environments? 
right? What are the opportunity structures that are available in your school and your after school program to actually allow for you to walk towards that path to your future goal orientation? And then lastly, a sense of agency, right? This notion that I can do it, this idea that I can actually walk on that path. And if we can create future goal orientation, robust and courageous pathways, and a powerful sense of agency, then we're building hope for young people and we're building hope for ourselves. So my friend Jeff Duncan Andrade wrote a wonderful article in the Harvard Education Review about hope. He named three types of hope, material hope, which is about changing the material conditions in young people's lives, Socratic hope, which is questioning the, con the conditions, questioning the ideas or questioning the, the ways in which um, schools are functioning or after school programs are functioning. And then lastly, audacious hope. And audacious hope, he says, is healing from oppression in order to transform it. And this is where I think our programs and our youth development strategies need to spend some time, right? That we understand that, that, in, that in many of the communities and schools that our young people are, or their families, they may come to us with some sense of hopelessness, and that our job is to heal from those conditions and then put them on a pathway to transforming the, is the issues that created the harm in the first place, right? Examples are as simple as young people organizing to get police out of their schools and invest in books, right? And so I'm gonna share with you some case studies about how we can begin to support hopefulness in our programs and program strategies. They say that you're not supposed to put more than three or four words on a slide, but I put this up there anyway, because I want to read it. I'll break the rules. Right. Youth development and civic engagement strategies designed to engage America's most disconnected young people will only be successful to the extent that they address hopelessness. Right. That this issue of hope needs to be fundamental to how we're thinking about our programs and strategies. So then what does it look like? How do we actually build the strategies? Virginia O'Leary gives us um, a model. And she says what generally happens in life, and this is relevant to us and it's re relevant to young people, is that we're walking along and then some form of social trauma can happen. We could lose our job, we lose a loved one, we could change schools. But when that form of social trauma happens in our own lives or in young people's lives, there's a loss of productivity, right? That our normal level of functioning declines. And when our normal level of functioning declines, we have three options. The first option is just survival, right? Which is what many young people are participating in, right? Survival is just, I just need to get through the day. Man, if I could just get through the week, I'll be okay. Maybe I just need to just get through the month, right? So survival is the first option. But if we get the kind of support from our programs, support from loved ones, we could recover to our normal level of functioning. We're OK again. But then she says there's a third option that she calls thriving. And thriving is essentially means that you're more resilient, that you're more powerful, that you're more insightful than you were prior to the instance of the trauma, that you're better off. right? and that our programs need to be thinking about not just survival, not just recovery, but actually creating thriving environments for young people to understand their social conditions, but also to transform it. I was explaining this idea to a friend of mine who's a botanist at UC Berkeley, and she was like, well, you know what? This thing called social toxicity, we have a, we kind of do this similar experiment, Sean, um, in our labs at UC Berkeley. And she says, what we do is we take these plants and we, we put them in these gas chambers, right? And we pump the gas chamber, the, 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 the chambers with toxic gas. And what we do is we, we sort of measure how long it takes for these plants to die. I was like, wow, that's morbid. That's not exciting. How is that related to what I'm trying to talk about? She says, just wait. One time what we did is we took a, we took a community of plants, right? We put those community of plants in that same gas chamber. And we pump the gas into the chamber, just like we did with one plant. But this time, something miraculous happened. 
the plants began to pull out different nutrients out of the soil. And they began to process those nutrients differently in their, in their plant stems. And the plants actually began to emit a gas in the chamber that cleaned the toxic gas up that we were pumping in. They detoxified their environment. They cleaned it up, right? And when she shared that with me, I thought that that was a powerful analogy for how our, our, our youth programs and our extended learning opportunities need to be thinking about supporting young people. How are we creating environments that are building hope and detoxifying the environment for young people? We call that process radical healing. Right? And radical healing constitutes three kinds of hope. That relational hope, restorative hope, and political hope. Right? And in the book, we provide case studies of how people are engaging in these practices. The first is relational hope. This is a picture of Devone Bogan, right? who was hired to run a program in Richmond, California. Richmond, California had the highest homicide rates in all of California per capita. It's a very small area in uh, a very small city in California. And they were spent, the city of Richmond was spending about $250,000 a year hiring police officers to address crime, but the crime rate continued to creep up. And so they went to Devone Bogan to say, hey, Devone, we, can you help us? We know you have, you're a longtime youth development professional. Can you help train our police officers to work with young people? He said, no, I have a better idea. Why don't you give me a couple million dollars from the city budget to hire ex-convicts to work with young people to love them to reduce violence? And what do you think the city of Richmond said? They laughed at him, get out of here, man. But then they came back the following year and said, hey, um, we need your help. And they gave him some money. And they said, he created a program that got young men out of prison, right? And the first person he hired was Joe. Joe was in prison, he had done years in prison, but Joe knew everyone in the community. And when I hung out with Joe to do this case study, I noticed a couple of really interesting things they were doing to build hope. And one time we were driving in a car in Richmond, and these are young men who carry guns, who shoot each other. Their job is to stop young men from killing. So, we're driving in a car, and there's some young men hanging on the corner, smoking weed, rolling dice. He got out of the car. He said, this is what we do, Dr. Jen, right? And he got out of the car, and I opened the door. He said, Dr. G, you may want to stay in here because they got guns. I was like, cool. <laughs> I'll stay in. And he said, it's OK. You can come out. And he had conversations with him, the young men on the corner. He said, you know, I took some, some food over to your mama's house. Uh, because, you, you know, you said you didn't have any food, and you, uh, Chris, you said um, you were looking for a job. I got that job application for you. And, hey, hey, Tyrone, I said, um, uh, you, you said your little brother wanted some cleats. I got some cleats in the, in the trunk of the car. So just come over, you, whenever you're ready, just come get the cleats. He began to talk to them like he was their uncle, building a relationship with them, right? And that relationship, he says, they, through that relationship, he can get them to do different things, change their behavior and decisions. It is through that courageous relationship he has with them that they can get them to actually stop shooting. Now, interestingly, Joe says, Sean, man, we don't, we don't um, uh, actually, as we walked away from the young men on the corner, he turned around and said, hey, y'all, you know, I love you, right? And the young man was like, yeah, man, we got love for you, too. I was like, wow, did you guys get trained to do that? He said, yeah, we were, we're trained to do, do, do that. We're trained to establish love relationships with these young men who carry guns. And that's a trait that we don't, we were, we're not able to get the police department to do. And he said, we don't, train, we don't tell them not to carry guns, because Joe's from the neighborhood. We don't tell them to do that. They said, when they're going to use the gun, that we ask them to call us. He said, two weeks ago, they were getting ready to go shoot. And they called me in the office. They said, Joe, man, I know you said we got to shoot, but we're getting ready to come. We're getting ready to go shoot these guys. Joe said, hold on, just come to the office. They came to the office, and Joe was like, they were all hyped up. Joe was like, OK, I see you guys going to go shoot. Um, and they were like, yeah, man, they were talking this. We're going to go shoot. He said, OK, before you go shoot, you guys, before you do that, let's go get some pizza. <laughs> I know that sounds funny, right? And they were like, huh, OK because they're 14, they're 13, 14, 15-year-old children, 
right? So by doing that, Joe can get them to make decisions about their behavior. And after t years and years and years of hiring people like Joe, this is the result of the relationships that they build in Richmond, California. The program began in 2009 with about 45 homicides. They did a research study um, just in 2014, and they brought the homicide rate the lowest it's been in decades. Right? These are the kinds of outcomes that we get when we use uh, relational hope. Right? We can actually change the conditions, the environments, and make them vibrant for young people to flourish. The second is called restorative hope. Restorative hope is the ability to restore and create healing opportunities for young people. Right? How do we make young people well where they can flourish again? This is a picture of a normal day in Bayview Hunters Point. Anybody familiar with San Francisco? This is a neighborhood in Bayview Hunters Point, San Francisco, where the kids just decided to set the playground on fire right? without much to do. A friend of mine had been a, a longtime youth development professional, ran a program called Hunters Point Family in, 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 um, uh, in, in San Francisco. And something odd had happened. There was actually, there was shootings in the neighborhood, but this time someone walked into the youth program and actually shot one of her adult youth workers. And she came to us very upset. And she was, uh, we were able to work with her and provide some support so that she can have the kind of mental health to continue. And she had decided that she's not going to do youth work anymore. She was tired of it. We got her a sabbatical, and she went to New York, and she saw the Harlem's Children's Zone, and she came back with a different kind of imagination about what the community needed, about what young people needed. It wasn't just the after-school tutoring, but they actually needed places to heal. She said, if I need to heal, then certainly the rest of these young people do. So she came back and she did a study. And she wanted to understand what were the healing opportunities for young people in San Francisco. And if you look at this map, we helped her sort of construct this map. The map, the red areas represent the mental health need in San Francisco. This is where Lena's program is, Hunters Point. This is where the mental health need, these are young people and these are adults who have ex expressed mental health need. The white dots represent where the dollars were being spent by the city of San Francisco, right? So you could see that the mental health need or the mental health dollars were not directed at the mental health need. So she be organized, she used organizing skills to talk to parents, to talk to teachers, to talk to young people, to lobby the school district, or to lobby the city of, of San Francisco to shift those dollars. And she said to me, Sean, it was like, you know, the red area is like the infection, but the white area is like the medicine. And so we wanted to shift those dollars, right, or shift those, um, those resources to the areas that needed it most. What she wanted to do in Baby Hunter's Point is not just have conventional mental health. What she wanted was yoga studios. She wanted meditation rooms. She wanted community gardens, things that, that, that are in the suburbs. And she said the first thing, and they were able to get $4 million the first year, and the first thing they did was create a yoga studio in the housing projects, right? In the housing projects. Now, the city believed that it was okay to have mental health facilities on other side of the ta of the other side of the city, but by putting it in the housing project, she was able to create a different kind of opportunity for those young people. Lastly, political hope, right? How are young people engaged in the political decisions in their lives, creating an opportunity to thrive and flourish? This is a picture of young people in Los Angeles, California. And in Los Angeles, California, and as in, in many of the school districts, I'm sure, here there's a clause that says that teachers can, can remove students from their classroom for willful defiance. And willful defiance is basically anything that the teacher believes to be defiant, right? You're chewing gum, get out. You got a hat on in my classroom, get out. Well, that policy was disproportionately impacting African American and Latino young people, the highest suspension rates in the country. And so the young people began to organize and say, we don't want, we want to first remove this policy. And they work with adults. And then on May 14th in 2013, they're organizing thousands of young people in Los Angeles, organizing with thousands of adults and young. We're able, we're able to convince the uh, Los Angeles 
a school district to remove that policy of willful defiance from its, from its uh, policy book. The following year, they were able to get $4.2 million allocated to restorative justice. So it's not just the removal of the policy, but it's also the implementation of a policy that creates well-being and hope. And then lastly, in 2015, they were able to pressure uh, the school district to spend an additional $1.3 million um, to remove the police, uh, remove the number of police, but also to allocate more to restorative justice funding. So through organizing and working with adults, those young people were not only able to remove a harmful policy, but also create a policy that contributed to their sense of well-being and hope. There's a couple of practices that I want you to think about as you leave today as it relates to building hope. Right? The first is how do you articulate your vision of hope and equity? Right? That's beyond the, the idea of providing opportunities or youth development opportunities. It's what is your vi vision of hope? Right? What are young people's vision of hope? Review your budget against time and money spent on hope and equity. So if we don't review our budgets, then it just becomes, you know, does it, you know, we measure priority by where we spend our time and when we spend our money. Right? And so you can look at your professional development budget. Are you providing opportunities for, for, for mental health for your youth development professionals? Are you providing opportunities for counselors or therapies, or are you holding healing circles in your youth development programs? Look at your time, where do you spend your time, and where do you spend your money on equity and hope? Oftentimes, it's difficult to move an entire organization around equity and hope, but it is possible to get buy-in from a small group of committed stakeholders first, four teachers. Right? We're working with schools where they're like, no, this is a hopeless environment. But four teachers and a staff of 60 say, we want to do this. We start with those four. And when the rest of the teachers see the outcome of those four, then another one comes along and another one comes along. So it's overwhelming sometimes to think about moving an entire system or an entire organization, but start where you are, start where you have buy-in. And then lastly, it's very easy to create an inventory of policies and practices that promote or inhibit hope and equity. And so policies that I found, we worked in uh, New Hampshire, and we found a policy where the teachers couldn't actually touch the kids all day. It was hands off. And I know that the policy is important because we don't want inappropriate touching, but they, the teachers were saying to us, we wanted to just hug our children when they walk into the school door. We want to just give them a hug, right? And so we have to look at the policies that are in place that sometimes prohibit our ability to be human with our young people, right? I want to end with this quote by Dr. King. He says that one of the greatest problems of history is that the concept of love and power have usually been contrasted as opposites. And what is needed is a realization that power without love is reckless and abusive, and that love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice. And justice at its best is power correcting everything that stands against love. Thank you very much.